Welcome back to these series of lectures. Um, today we're going to talk about imperialism. I'll define it first. Um, imperialism is the policy uh, whereby a great industrial power uh, imposes its will uh, on a, a lesser powerful country. Uh, you can impose your will militarily, economically, or politically. And uh, there are those historians who have made the argument that imperialism grows directly out of uh, the Industrial Revolution uh, in that the uh, primary job of, and I heard one historian make this argument, that the primary purpose of the United States President is to make the world safe for American business. Um, we have to secure markets for our products, we have to secure cheap labor and uh, cheap natural resources. So imperialism grows directly out of the Industrial Revolution. Now this is the second era of imperialism. The first, of course, begins with Columbus uh, back in the 15th century. Here in the latter part of the 19th century, the European powers uh, for economic and for purposes of status uh, are expanding their holdings in Asia, Africa, and other places around the world. What I want to do here is to mention a couple of sources of the uh, uh, power that the Europeans have. What do they possess that allows them to dominate so much of the uh, what was used to be called the underdeveloped part of the world? And then I want to talk about uh, degrees of control that the imperial powers uh, exert. And then I want to talk about the four interpretations or justifications of imperialism. After that, we'll talk about uh, United States imperialism in particular. Um, sources of power. The great industrial powers have uh, obviously a, a great industrial plant. They have uh, agricultural resources. Uh, they have modern uh, communication systems. Uh, they have uh, navies and merchant marine where they can uh, project their power around the world. Uh, they have uh, sophisticated military institutions where they can um, protect their interest. And they have psychological factors as well, a sense of superiority, um, a superior system of government, a superior religion, um, a superior market economy. Uh, this gives the great, the great powers uh, a great deal of self-confidence in their ability to expand their power and to justify that expansion. Degrees of control, I'm going to mention three, and we'll start with the, the least coercive and uh, move towards the most hands-on method of control. Uh, the least coercive would simply be what we call the sphere of, sphere of influence. Um, sphere of influence, the country lies close to the great power and is therefore dominated because of that physical proximity. You can think of the Caribbean with the United States, or indeed uh, much of the Western Hemisphere lies in the sphere of influence of the United States. Uh, in a sphere of influence, you don't need to colonize or uh, impose direct control over the lesser country. And I use lesser here simply in the means of uh, lesser developed. The sheer fact that you lie physically close to the great power makes it inevitable that you will be dominated by it. Again, uh, the Caribbean is a good example. Now, a more hands-on method of control uh, would be a protectorate. And a good example here would be uh, probably be Cuba. Uh, from the Spanish-American War in 1898 uh, up until 1959 when Fidel Castro takes over, Cuba uh, was essentially a protectorate of the United States. Uh, we handpicked Cuban leaders quite often, trained their police forces, trained their uh, military forces. Uh, Cuban leaders looked after our interest in Cuba as opposed to uh, Cuba's interest. Uh, we had great uh, multinational corporations operating in Cuba, extracting uh, natural resources from the island, uh, using cheap Cuban labor. Uh, for mining, uh, for citrus, for various agricultural reasons, for sugar, obviously. Uh, so Cuba really existed as sort of a, a colony, I'll call it a protectorate, of the United States. And this continues all the way up until 1959 when Castro changes that relationship. Uh, we'll talk about this later when we get to the Cold War. 
this is going to create a lot of problems for the United States. Uh, and even today, in, uh, in 2015, we are just now beginning the first tentative steps towards reestablishing a normal relationship with Cuba after, half, after a half century. So this is an ongoing and interesting um, problem uh, for the United States. Uh, from a protectorate, we go to the most hands-on means of control, and that is um, annexation. Uh, to annex another state is to bring it into the body politic of your country. The, uh, the best example I can think of would be Hawaii. Uh, after the Spanish-American War, Hawaii fell within the sphere of influence of the United States. Um, after, it became, after, after it was discovered that, uh, and the Dole Company was uh, one of the primary movers in this, when it was discovered that pineapple could be grown there in great quantities, uh, the Dole Company set up uh, plantations, large-scale agriculture in Hawaii, and um, Hawaii rapidly became a protectorate of the United States. Of course, Pearl Harbor, probably the greatest natural harbor in the Pacific, uh, was coveted by the United States Navy, and uh, Hawaii became a protectorate. Now, in 1958 or 59, uh, Hawaii was finally annexed to the United States. It became part of the country. This is obviously the most uh, severe or the most hands-on method of control that a great power can exert. Now, I want you to take a look at some of the images that we've supplied for you um, as we begin this discussion of uh, justification of imperialism. You see these maps of Africa and Asia. You'll notice that uh, it would appear that Africa is little more than a giant pizza with every European power uh, seeking to get a slice. You can even see even some of the smallest European countries have intruded upon Africa. Belgium, for instance, dominates the Central African uh, Congo, uh, the colony in this case being much larger than the mother country. Uh, you see the picture here of uh, Cecil Rhodes. Um, the great British uh, industrialist, he begins the, the mining endeavors in South Africa. Uh, there was even once a country called Rhodesia in, in Southern Africa. Today it's called Zimbabwe. And you can see Cecil Rhodes is using Africa sort of as a doormat, uh, with one foot in Cairo and the other foot in Cape Town. And of course Britain, Britain dominated East Africa from Egypt to South Africa. You see the picture here of uh, the map of Asia. Asia, like Africa, and uh, much of Central and South America being divided up among the great powers. Here, of course, you see uh, turn of the century imperialism in China. You see China yelling stop as the European powers divide China up. Uh, it's difficult to tell here if China is being depicted as a pizza or a large cookie. Nevertheless, the message is clear. Here you can see England and France dividing up the world. Uh, looks like a Thanksgiving turkey, perhaps. And then, of course, the British Empire depicted here as an immense octopus with multiple tentacles reaching out and possessing uh, countries throughout the world. What was the old saying? The, uh, the sun never sets on the British Empire? Indeed. Now, let's talk about some justifications uh, for imperialism. I'm going to mention four. The economic justification for imperialism was developed by Lenin. Uh, we'll talk about Lenin more when we get to the uh, First World War and the Russian Revolution. Lenin uh, was living in exile, I believe he was in, Sweet, uh, in Switzerland, uh, around 1900, publishing a radical paper. In this journal, he uh, uh, wrote an essay and he made an argument. Uh, a very powerful and simple argument. He said the great powers, the great industrial powers, would seek to uh, colonize and dominate uh, other parts of the world for three reasons. One, uh, to extract natural resources from these underdeveloped countries. Two, to uh, use cheap labor that's available here. Uh, people can be paid much less, obviously. And three, to uh, develop markets for the great powers' products, those things that are produced. 
Lenin said that the competition among the great powers for these uh, things would lead to war. And of course, the Great War uh, started in 1914, just uh, about a decade after Lenin published this essay. Uh, and indeed, imperialism is one of the causes of the Great War. The second uh, justification for imperialism is the religious uh, justification. And this is also very simple to understand. Uh, there's a sense in the West that it is our obligation to take uh, our superior religion, in this case Christianity, to uh, the heathen, to the pagans throughout Africa, Asia. Of course, the, the presence of the church and of missionaries in these lands tends to uh, pave the way for um, industrial civilization to follow. And you can see the map here, the third justification for imperialism is the strategic justification. And you can see a map here of the British Empire, and you can see why the sun never sets on the British Empire. Uh, the strategic interpretation says that the great power will gain access to sea, uh, water routes, or land routes uh, to make access to its colonies quicker, safer. A uh, good example here would be India. Uh, the, the British Empire, the crown jewel of the British Empire, was the colony in India, in South and Central Asia. And the British sought to gain quicker access, uh, cheaper, safer access to the colony. Uh, by acquiring rights at Gibraltar and at Suez. Of course, the Suez Canal belongs to Egypt, so Egypt had to be uh, dominated by the British in order for the British to control the Suez Canal. This cuts the trip dramatically, uh, the trip around the Cape of Good Hope. Now you can go through the Mediterranean and then through Suez into the Arabian Sea, and then it's a quick uh, trip to India. And then the final, justification for imperialism uh, is the cultural. There are two aspects to it. Uh, first is the white man's burden, and this is my favorite illustration of this concept. You see a, probably a retired British military official. He's probably been given a position somewhere in Africa, maybe India, as a colonial official now. You see him washing his hands, and you see the title of the product that we're advertising here is Pear Soap. Read the, uh, read the copy. The first step towards lightening the white man's burden is in uh, teaching the, variety, uh, the virtues of cleanliness. Uh, and then you can see at the bottom, the, uh, the copy continues. Pear soap is a potent factor, brightening the dark corners of the earth as civilization advances. Uh, the message here is pretty simple. Uh, before we dredge your rivers, before we lay telegraph lines, before we convert you to Christianity, before we bring the market economy and Republican-style government to you, uh, we're going to have to give you a bath because you're dirty and uh, you're savage. So the white man's burden suggests that we are colonizing your territories, not for us, but for you. You can see a play on this theme as uh, Uncle Sam is carried by a, one of his Filipino colonists, John Bull carried by one of his Indian uh, colonial subjects. And then, of course, I'll refer you to Rudyard Kipling's famous poem, The White Man's Burden, which lays out these ideas uh, very well. And then the last part of the cultural interpretation of imperialism is the uh, what we would call social Darwinism or a racial hierarchy among nations. And you can see this image, and this is from a textbook, this is not a parody. White European Christians at the top, people of color uh, lesser and further down the hierarchy. And you can see the same message uh, demonstrated here, also from a college textbook at the turn of the century whereby white Europeans are at the top of the hierarchy and lesser peoples follow. Again, this justifies uh, imperialism, justifies the domination of one people by another because it implies a certain natural superiority of one people. And uh, this is a very strong psychological justification for imperialism. Thank you.